Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, this has been an amazing um, conference. And I, I just wanted to, you know, my, my main disclosure is that I am a gastroenterologist and I run the Cancer Genetics Clinical Program. So when we're talking about cancers that are diagnosed in young individuals, and especially GI cancers, it's my, it's my objective to talk to you about what we're doing in clinical practice now um, to try to take better care of, of these high-risk patients. And so my talk's gonna cover the perspectives of what are the genetic factors that we know are associated with increased risk? How does environmental exposure um, play into what we recommend? And what can we do in the realm of health behaviors to change things? So um, for risk stratification for colorectal cancer, when we talk about, you know, patient comes into your office and you stratify the risk for colorectal cancer, we rely very heavily on age, right? And all of us have seen the new guidelines that, de that 45 is the new 50. So the age of colorectal cancer screening for average risk individuals was decreased um, from 50 to 45. Um, we talk about personal history, whether an individual has a prior history of colorectal neoplasia, whether they have inflammatory bowel disease. And then we talk about family history, which typically most of my GI fellows just ask, is there any, is there any colon cancer in your family? Well, how good is this? So you all have seen this, um, this slide before, that when we look at um, colorectal cancer incidence among people over the age of 50, we're doing pretty well because you know what? Screening actually decreases, screening for colorectal cancer with removing polyps actually decreases um, the incidence of colorectal cancer and certainly early detection decreases mortality. Um, but what we're seeing in young people is the opposite trend. So what we're doing right now is not good enough. Um, where did the 50 come from? Well, 50, there's nothing magic about age, right? Um, age is just a number. And I think when you look at um, what the data from SEER looked like in terms of distribution of colorectal cancer diagnosis by age, circa uh, 2000, um, you know, it seemed reasonable to draw the line at 50 because there were fewer diagnoses of colorectal cancer in people under the age of 50. Well, you've all seen other curves now that this has now shifted. Um, and we're seeing a higher proportion among individuals um, under the age of 45, um, uh, uh, under the age of 50 than were before. So the, multi the US Multi-Society multi Task Force in 2022 made the suggestion that average risk colorectal cancer screening begin at age 45. And they based this recommendation on observations of the increasing disease burden among young people. They also looked and saw that when they looked at the incidence of colorectal neoplasm, so, so advanced colorectal polyps and cancer in people ages 45 to 49, they basically saw that this looks exactly like what it looked like between 50 and 55 year olds um, 10 years early, you know, back in the 2000s. And certainly modeling studies demonstrated that the benefits of, screen, of, of, of decreasing the age to start screening um, uh, uh, were outweigh the potential harms and costs. So for young onset colorectal cancer, what does this look like? Well, this table is actually um, from our publication from our experience at University of Michigan, um, where we looked at 430 young individuals with colorectal cancer diagnosed under the age of 50. And as you've heard before, you know, half of this group is diagnosed under age 45. So moving the screening age of diagnosis from 50 to 45 solves part of the problem, but it doesn't solve the whole problem. Um, importantly, three quarters of these young individuals with colorectal cancer have no family history of colorectal cancer in a first degree relative. So how are we gonna find these folks? Um, because our current screening al algorithms aren't, aren't working. So um, in this same cohort, we, I, because I run the Cancer Genetics Clinical Program, we were actually able to look at the outcomes of genetic testing in this population. And certainly, um, one out of every five young people with, um, with uh, colorectal cancer carries a germline alteration in a cancer susceptibility gene. What we find most commonly are uh, mismatch repair gene mutations associated with Lynch syndrome, which as many of you know, has a lifetime risk of colorectal cancer of 50 to 70% in the absence of uh, frequent colonoscopies. Um, there were also individuals with polyposis syndromes here, and many, about one third of individuals with familial adenomatous polyposis have no family history of FAP because they represent new mutations in the family. Um, but interestingly, we also found um, individuals with other cancer susceptibility gene alterations, mainly BRCA1 and BRCA2, P53 associated with leaf Raminy syndrome, um, and as well as other moderate penetrance genes like CHECK2. 
So um, importantly, um, when we look at, you know, um, what does this mean? What was interesting is that half of these individuals who had mutations in cancer susceptibility genes uh, did not meet criteria for the particular syndrome that their uh, gene alteration corresponded to. So for this reason, and because um, our findings were, were corroborated by those of other groups, um, led to the recommendation that all individuals with colon cancer under the age of 50 um, undergo germline genetic testing for cancer susceptibility. So what does germline, what does cancer susceptibility uh, spectrum look like? Um, we developed this diagram because for many years in cancer genetics, you would talk about hereditary breast cancer and hereditary colorectal cancer. But the reality is that there's tremendous overlap in the mechanisms uh, for pathogenesis of many of these cancers. And so thinking about the particular syndrome often blinds you to what other cancer risks are there. And so here, certainly in the realm of colorectal cancer, which is in the blue, we see Lin the Lynch syndrome mismatch repair genes are probably the biggest component um, accompanied by um, other alteration, uh, other genes associated with polyposis syndromes. But certainly the hereditary breast cancer or the genes associated with susceptibility to breast cancer in the pink um, uh, can have significant overlap when it comes to GI cancers, especially when we talk about uh, pancreatic cancers and, uh, and upper GI cancers as well. So assessing risk for colorectal cancer. So we've got two, two, two families here. So we've got the person on the right, or sorry, on your left, um, who has a, a 24 year old whose mother uh, died of colorectal cancer at 53 and whose grandmother uh, died of ovarian cancer at 42. And then we've got the 24 year old on your right um, that has three individuals in the family with colorectal cancer with one individual diagnosed under the age of 50. So how good are we at picking up these folks and what should we be doing differently um, uh, for these 24 year olds, right? I can't tell you how many patients I've seen who present with family histories like this to their doctor, to their primary care doctor. Their primary care doctor says, oh, don't worry, you don't need to do anything for cancer screening. There's nothing you need to worry about yet because you're too young. But the reality is that both of these individuals actually meet criteria for germline genetic testing. And we've got to do a better job of finding these folks, right? So, you know, what's important here is that both of these individuals, if they have a pathogenic germline variant associated with Lynch syndrome, actually need to start doing their colonoscopies now um, and uh, potentially repeating colonoscopies every one to two years. Um, whereas if they are found not to, if their genetic testing is um, negative for Lynch syndrome, it would be reasonable for them to begin their colonoscopy at age 40 um, and repeat it every three to five years. So in terms of our, 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 our risk assessment in clinical practice um, uh, could be improved. Um, so let's talk about cancer, risk for GI cancers in individuals that have Lynch syndrome and hereditary breast ovarian cancer, because I neglected to point out on the previous slide that the these hereditary cancer syndromes are not as rare as people thought they were. The population prevalence of Lynch syndrome is one in 279. The population prevalence of, of BRCA alterations is about one in 300, um, and actually one in 40 in individuals of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. So when we look at the cancers that are, that the cancer risks that are increased in these conditions, we see our GI cancers for which there is screening available. We see colorectal cancer, we see pancreatic cancer, and we see gastric cancer. And certainly, I think there's a growing consensus um, in the cancer screening world uh, that if an individual's lifetime risk for cancer is 5% or greater, maybe it's worth actually screening because the average person's risk for colorectal cancer, lifetime risk for colorectal cancer is about 5%. So if we can identify people whose risk for other cancer types is 5% or higher, it's probably worth screening. So. I mentioned pancreas cancer. Um, so what do we do for screening for pancreas cancer? Well, many of you may um, remember that the US Preventive Services back in 2019 actually issued a grade D recommendation recommending against screening for pancreatic cancer in asymptomatic individuals, stating that, the, that there's adequate, adequate evidence, the benefits are no greater um, than small or, or, at, or at, while the harms are at least mod, moderate in terms of uh, of uh, harms of screening. So the conclusion was that the potential harms outweighed the benefits. But 
um, when this uh, when was this was posted for com for public comment, um, the um, several several people in the field actually spoke up and said, you know, maybe no pancreatic cancer screening for average risk individuals because their lifetime risk for pancreatic cancer is about one point seven percent, but there are plenty of individuals whose risk for pancreatic cancer is probably high is higher than five percent, and so the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force actually relented and um, added the caveat that their grade D recommendation for screening did not apply to individuals at above average risk. And this is really important because um, we now have some really interesting data that, um, pancreas, that screening for pancreatic cancer in the group of individuals who are considered at higher than average risk for pancreatic cancer, and the, these mean pancreatic cancer risks over the course of the lifetime of 5% or greater, um, when the data from the CAPS uh, studies actually looked at looked at a you know diagnoses of incident pancreatic cancers in individuals under screening, as well as survival of individuals with screen detected pancreatic cancers. They demonstrated that pretty dramatically, as you look at the um, in the top curve, individuals who had screen detected uh, screen detected pancreatic cancers had significantly better survival um, and were more likely to have cancers detected at resectable stages. So this was kind of a game changer in terms of pancreatic cancer. And so when we look at this, these two individuals here, so here is a 44-year-old who had a mother who died of pancreatic cancer at age 70. And then we have another 44-year-old who has a mother who had pancreatic cancer, mother's brother had pancreatic cancer, and maternal grandfather had pancreatic cancer. There's actually something pretty definite that we're going to recommend for these two 40-year-olds, 40, 40 right? So what is the, how do, how do we assess risk for lifetime risk for pancreatic cancer? Well, in terms of family history of pancreatic cancer, we also know now that among unselected pancreatic cancers, approximately one in every between five and 10 individuals with the diagnosis of pancreatic cancer has a pathogenic germline variant and a cancer susceptibility gene. So look at that list of genes here, and we see a lot of the usual suspects. We see the BRCA genes, we see the Lynch, the genes associated with Lynch syndrome, as well as moderate penetrance risk genes like ATM and CHECK2, as well as CDKN2A, which many of you will recognize as one of the primary drivers of pancreatic cancer. So um, based on the findings that germline alterations are quite common in unselected individuals with pancreatic cancer diagnoses, I was, I was really um, honored to be part of an ASCO uh, clinical provisional opinion um, that recommended um, uh, germline genetic testing for all pancreatic cancers. So should we screen these individuals for pancreatic cancer? So what does individual, how, how do we get to that threshold of 5%? Um, well, in the family on the right, where there are three individuals with pancreatic cancer diagnoses, um, that, that exceeds the 5% lifetime risk threshold. For the individual on the left who has just one individual with pancreatic cancer, or one individual in the family with pancreatic cancer, genetic testing would be really helpful because we know that if we find a pathogenic germline variant in, say, BRCA or Lynch syndrome, then that puts that individual over that 5% threshold. Whereas if there is no pathogenic germline variant and only one individual with pancreatic cancer in the family, <coughs> that lifetime pancreatic risk uh, barely exceeds 3% and is not over that 5% threshold. So I want to show you actually a real story of a 39-year-old who presented to their um, primary care doctor um, for a health maintenance exam. And he reported that his, doc uh, that his sister had been diagnosed with breast cancer and was and also happened to have a history of having had two primary melanomas. And so because of the diagnosis of breast cancer, she was referred for genetic testing. And her genetic testing revealed that she had a um, CDKN2A pathogenic germline variant. Now, what's really interesting about this family history, right, is the fact that his dad had pancreatic cancer. But that didn't trigger any bells or whistles for anyone. But now his sister has a um, mutation CDKN2A that's associated with familial multiple mole melanoma and um, a lifetime pancreatic cancer risk of 16 to 20%. So we tested him, and he carried a pathogenic, the same pathogenic germline variant in CDKN2A. We did an MRCP uh, for pancreatic cancer screening and identified a one centimeter mass in the head of his pancreas that was a stage one pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, and this was resected and cured. 
So we're talking about how do we improve outcomes in young onset gastrointestinal cancers. And this is how we do it. We actually find these cancers early in time to be able to intervene before they become advanced. So um, as part of a review that we wrote for gastroenterology, we actually proposed a strategy for pancreatic cancer risk assessment in that if you screen, if you do germline genetic testing on every pancreas cancer patient um, and then do a risk assessment for everyone in the general population regarding family history of pancreatic cancer or family history of cancer that could have an increased risk for pancreatic cancer, then you can identify a cohort of, uh, you can identify individuals who meet that 5% threshold and actually um, intervene with uh, pancreatic cancer screening with endoscopic ultrasound, alternating with MRCP, and certainly intervening early on some of these, um, on some of these early lesions. So what about gastric cancer? So we've spent a lot of the day today talking about colorectal cancer, a little bit of talking about pancreatic cancer, but what about gastric cancer? So, you know, for families that look like this, where somebody comes in and says, oh, everybody in my family has gastric cancer, that sets off bells and whistles for a lot of us. And we say, oh, well, let's do something about it. Could there be a genetic susceptibility or, or we should probably do an upper endoscopy to see if you have H. pylori or something else that is treatable that can change the natural history of the, of the, of the gastrointestinal metaplasia. But what about people who look like this? So what if there is a 44-year-old who comes to your clinic and says, my mother died of stomach cancer? There aren't really any good recommendations right now for who we should screen for stomach cancer, or at least in the GI community, um, uh, we're trying to raise awareness here that, that gastric cancer is becoming a bigger problem in the United States, um, because certainly we know that the risk for gastric cancer is not the same for everyone, and the risk of gastric cancer all over the world varies tremendously. Um, as you see in Asia and in countries in Latin America, the risk for gastric cancer in many countries exceed uh, the risk for colorectal cancer. And certainly with um, individuals who have who, who emigrated from these areas uh, to the United States, um, being aware of gastric cancer risk is incredibly important. So I'd like to propose that, you know, the, the blue line across the top is what we currently do um, in risk stratification for gastrointestinal cancers. So age, personal history, family history. But we probably need to move beyond this. We need to consider an individual's um, rate sex, race, ethnicity, um, comorbidities like obesity and diabetes, lifestyle factors, smoking, diet, microbiome, and, and, and whether or not they're physically active. You know, we're, we are actually behind what our colleagues in cardiovascular medicine have been doing for years, right? Because they've actually been running models that incorporate a lot of these other risk factors um, that we're not yet considering. And certainly there's a question of what is, the, what is the contribution of genetic factors by environmental factors? And certainly um, there's more to do there. So putting up um, Terry Manolio's um, uh, uh, diagram here about the, 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 missing, uh, the missing genetic factors, we know that up at the top, um, there are rare alleles that cause very strong strongly penetrant Mendelian diseases. So that's one in every five colorectal cancers has a, has a highly penetrant pathogenic germline variant. But there's probably a lot more um, genes that are down in the brown side of the spectrum that are common variants that are identified through GWAS studies as having a very small individual effects on, on, on risk for gastrointestinal cancers. Um, and certainly is there more that we can do with this? So there has been work um, looking at integrating um, uh, uh, GWAS results uh, with environmental exposures. And certainly Ricky Peters' group has, um, has, has really uh, paved, uh, led the way in looking at, are there better ways that we can predict risk for early onset colorectal cancer, looking at genetic by environmental factors. And what they did was they actually developed a polygenic risk score that included 141 single nu nucleotide polymorphisms that were identified through colorectal cancer GWASs. And then they developed an environmental risk score that included 16 uh, lifestyle factors. And then they looked at how this would perform uh, for predicting risk for, for uh, early colorectal <coughs> cancer. And so what were some of the factors that went into this environmental score? Well, the usual suspects, individuals, BMI, level of ed education, diabetes, physical activity, fiber, <laughs> fiber intake, calcium levels, um, folic acid, processed meat, you name it, um, the usual suspects, as we say. But then when they actually looked at, they, they integrated the environmental risk score 
um, with the polygenic risk score. And they were able to show that in the quartiles, as you, increase, as you actually combine the highest quartiles of environmental risk scores and polygenic risk scores, you actually get a little bit better prediction um, than you do um, for uh, family for, for, for when you use family history alone. And interestingly, when they looked at the, the, the impact of this on prediction of late onset colorectal cancers, it was kind of a wash. But for predicting individuals with early onset colorectal cancer, it performed better than family history alone. But still, as you can see, and I'm sorry, the font's really small, um, the, uh, the, the AUC was only 0.63. So there's still, we can do better in terms of prediction. And so I think that as we've been talking about today, what it comes down to is in order to find that the individual on the right who has a family history of, of cancer, we should be doing better at finding those individuals and identifying them early and being able to prevent their colorectal cancers through early screening and early detection. But for the individual on the left, who's the, the, the first person in their family with any cancer diagnosis, how are we gonna find these folks? And I think, as we talked about, what we need to do is we need to identify what are the drivers of neoplasia in this population. And so Andrana Holowati actually developed this really nice diagram, which I think looks at where are we thinking. So we, I've spent a lot of time talking to you about genetics, but really genetics is not all of it. There's a lot more going on here that we've all been talking about today. Individual factors, factors related to the built environment, what's going on in your neighborhood, what's in your water supply, what are you doing for your physical activity? And then likewise, um, the issues of access to care um, and, and, uh, and, and quality of care, a bit availability of screening and, and, and high quality healthcare. Um, I really love this map because it is really striking to look at the incidence rates for early onset colorectal cancer in the United States. Because as you can see, um, it's not the same everywhere. And in fact, it's very, very different with the highest rates of colorectal cancer incidence in young people um, occurring in the South, in areas like Louisiana. Um, I'm from University of Michigan, and we are actually very excited. Um, we have a grant in collaboration with um, Laura Rosick from Georgetown, who is actually way up back there in the audience. Um, we're actually going to look at um, colorectal cancers uh, ascertained through cancer registries in the Detroit metro area and in Louisiana. Um, with the hope of being able to identify through surveys, um, specific exposures, and actually through analysis of tumors, um, the potential signature, tumor signatures um, uh, for, to see wh are, what are the similarities and differences um, in these uh, tumors that we're seeing by geography, um, by sociodemographic characteristics. And I think that, you know, it's through... Do, through linking the epidemiology data with the analysis of the tumors themselves, I think that we're gonna be able to make progress because we know that not every colorectal cancer is the same and actually being able to look at the different types of tumors that we're seeing in these populations and making some relationships um, to identify what the underlying drivers are. So in terms of precision medicine, you know, one size does not fit all. I think that what we need to do here is we need to find ways that we can look at the patient who's sitting in front of us and determine what is this individual's level of risk? What is the best type of screening test we can do? When should we start screening this individual? You know, age is just a number. Um, it is a guide, but we can do better. And I think that in term, not only in terms of cancer screening, but actually in terms of things that we can do for primary prevention. You know, uh, there's a lot of interest in looking at what what uh, agents such as aspirin uh, can do in this population, and certainly in the population of individuals at risk for Lynch syndrome, uh, that, who I take care of, certainly aspirin is, has been recommended um, for those individuals as well. Um, so I mentioned genetic testing, and I think I, I, I always um, tell my uh, GI fellows that uh, you know, if one out of every 279 people has Lynch syndrome, there's a lot of people coming through our endoscopy units who have Lynch syndrome and we don't even realize it. Being able to identify individuals that increase risk for cancer and recommending genetic testing is really important. And we know that there's a lot of different factors that impact who, 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 who makes it to genetic testing. In the state of Michigan, um, we, we are fortunate to have um, 
uh, a U01 Cancer Moonshot grant um, in collaboration with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. And we were able to look at who gets genetic testing in Michigan. And as of 2018, uh, over 85% of individuals getting tested in Michigan were women, white women with a personal or family history of breast cancer. So again, in the GI cancer world, we can do better. Um, and I think that when we look at how are we best gonna improve outcomes in early onset GI cancers, I think integrating cancer risk assessment into routine health maintenance. This is something that every primary care doctor should be doing, every, every, every gastroenterologist, every oncologist. Screen family history, even for individuals who are under age 45. Genetic evaluation for people who meet criteria. Risk stratification includes more than age and family history and certainly reducing the disparities in, in healthcare delivery, increasing uptake of cancer screening and expanding access to high quality care. Because you know, mentioning those red flag symptoms, most individuals with early onset colorectal cancer have had some symptoms for either months or years before their diagnosis. And so being alert and acting on those immediately is important. And then finally, identifying mechanisms for pathogenesis um, through epidemiological studies going from bench to the bedside, modifying risk factors and targeting therapies for cancer treatment and prevention. And just to end with one plug about precision medicine, we are very excited to be part of a um, uh, National, uh, National Cancer Institute Division of Cancer Prevention uh, Consortium that is actually um, doing a Lynch syndrome vaccine. Um, uh, testing a vaccine for Lynch syndrome or to prevent colorectal neoplasia in patients with Lynch syndrome. And this was a vaccine that was developed actually many years ago for, for, um, um, for patients with colorectal cancer and sat on the shelf for many years. But um, I think that as we identify individuals in different risk groups, being able to develop <coughs> interventions uh, for these folks will be most important. So on that note, I wanna thank you all so much for your attention and uh, thank you again.